So our final speaker for this morning uh, is Stuart Reid. Um, Stuart, no doubt, probably needs little introduction to this group, but uh, I'll proceed um, anyway. Uh, uh, Stuart was actually born and bred in Wellington, so is returning home in, in a sense. Um, and I guess Australia's been lucky to claim his, him as, as one of our own, um, and perhaps Stuart should have been added to that slide that Fiona had up yesterday. Um, I think probably the best outline of um, Stuart that I can recall is, um, is Richard Aiken's description of him as an opinionated so-and-so from Sydney, uh, which is probably true, and no doubt we'll, we'll hear some of those opinions today in his, um, his paper. Um, Stuart, you also went to Lincoln uh, Horticultural College in, in Canterbury as well, so um, a, again, um, some similar um, backgrounds for John and uh, Stuart. Uh, and Stuart this morning is going to take us through uh, a journey through Botanic Gardens, specifically Singapore, Spain and Sydney, and hopefully will warm us up for our trip to Wellington Botanic Gardens earlier, uh, later today. Please welcome Stuart. Tenakatu katoa. This is my town and this is my harbour. And, and in Maori, I can't do it properly, but they say, Koko te manga, Koko is my mountain, it's the highest peak. Te whanganui a Tara is my water, my, my harbour in this case, the great harbour of Tara. Uh, te Ate Awa is my people, my tribe, it's the, lo the local and the recently local tribe, there's been a lot of tribes. <laughs> and Okiwi is my place, and Okiwi is the Maori name for Eastbourne, which is across the harbour where I grew up. So it's, it's rather a pleasure to be speaking in my town for a change uh, and thinking thoughts about this country for a change. I'm always thinking thoughts about this country. Wellington Botanic Garden was my first, and I'm nuts about botanic gardens, as you'll see. Um, they're important, and they're important for plants, and I'm nuts about plants, but also for history uh, and economic history, money, quite serious money, and places of learning and places of wonder. And as you'll see, I'm still wondering, but hopefully you'll be a bit in wonder. Uh, and this talk is really to make the point that they're also under threat, that um, Tim and Melbourne are way ahead of the game here in studying climate change and figuring out what will survive in the next 50 or 100 years in a botanic garden in Melbourne. And that's a common problem around the world because the world's climate is changing. And as you heard yesterday, change is absolutely constant in New Zealand and the shaky isles in particular. So what kind of food, fibre, uh, shelter will we have in the future? You may love to death what we've got right now, but it may not survive. So that's one kind of threat. Governments and funding are a very real kind of threat. And that's partly what this talk is about is how do they get their money these days and how do they engage an audience that might help fund them and therefore financial viability into the future. And um, you can have various positive or negative opinions about that, but that's a very real issue. So this is a bit of a romp through uh, botanic gardens. I was lucky to study uh, gardens and people like me across Spain. Uh, and here we are in Madrid on the left and in Singapore on the right. A couple of old gardens, not Madrid's first, but it's current, next to the Prado. If you have too much art, go next door. Uh, and I was very pleased to be involved in Singapore Botanic Gardens going on the World Heritage List. And that was an interesting process, but the story of rubber, and it's a good example of economic botany. You know, rubber was stolen off South America and commercialised thanks to the British in Singapore and thanks to networks of botanic gardens as economic botany. It's serious money. Uh, and that story is part of why it's on, and that network, why it's on this, the World Heritage List. I'm not good at numbers. I'm the son of an accountant. I didn't get that gene. So the numbers are right on the screen. And please don't ask me questions about dates, because I've given you dates. Just memorize them if that's of interest to you. Uh, but also about young. I, I was interested in young botanic gardens. And Spain's doing a series of these. They're all pretty much interested in conservation and in locality and regionality because it's stripped most of its flora and it has a high population, especially in spectacular places. And here we are on limestone in Mallorca in a very spectacular place in an old estate garden that's a new botanic garden entirely focused on endangered species, the Mediterranean basin and Macronesia, which is 
the Mediterranean and the outside basin, if you like, the Canary Islands, Madeira. Fascinating and, and empty of people, unfortunately, when I was there. Here's another one, falling off a cliff in the Costa Brava uh, is this nature reserve, about a five or 10% of which is a modern and a spanking interesting botanic garden. And again, it's pitching at conservation. You can't visit the nature reserve part of it, a bit like Cranbourne, where well, you can visit, uh, but also pitching to tourism because the Costa Brava is full of Northern Europeans uh, warming up on holiday and wanting something pleasant to do. And beaches get a bit boring after a while, so they've got a rather fantastic, funky library in downtown Blanes, but they've also got this wonderful garden around the corner. If you're on a cruise boat and popping into Tenerife on the Canary Islands, oh, the hardships, uh, you may get bored with beaches too and hotels and casinos and wish to go inland. And here's two wonderful early 1700s botanic gardens. Notice that date. Isn't that an interesting date for an Australian audience? Um, where would a ship stop to pick up wine, water, plants, perhaps sheep, perhaps, en route to Australia or, or fill up going back to Britain? Mmm, I wonder where. Um, and it's full of Australian trees. What's a flame tree or a currajong doing in a garden like that? I couldn't imagine. Or, a, you know, a Lord Howe Island fig tree. Fascinating. So, you know, again, not chock-a-block full of tourists, but available and interesting, very interesting historically. But also brand new ones. This is the dragon tree, and, it, and that tree is almost the same size as the town it's in. We've lost most of our old dragon trees on, on Tenerife. And here's a young guy, here's their version of the Opera House uh, downtown on Grand Canary, sorry. Uh, two islands in one slide and a young botanic garden in an old quarry slash farm site. Fantastic, with a grove of dragon trees, which are no doubt going to blow up their planters in time when you see how big they get. Lovely. And here we are doing interesting things in an ex-sand mine on the outskirts of Melbourne, uh, pitching to a new audience. You know, I live in a small house. I'm having to downsize and have a courtyard, but I love native plants. What can I grow? Really clever, and these are sort of intimations of houses or intimations of front gardens with native plants doing the job that perhaps an exotic plant. A good idea. And if you haven't been to Cranbourne, it's really interesting because it's, you know, I've only got a balcony. I live in an apartment. Here's some native orchids growing on racks and quite attractive racks. You know, I could do that. And that's the message is you could do this. You know, these plants are really interesting. Why settle for something boring like a begonia when you could do something funky like a green hood orchid? Go figure. Um, uh, botanic gardens are really pitching to the public these days. You have to. Um, Centennial Park has been shotgun wedded to the botanic gardens in Sydney, and they now, Centennial Park at least, get no government funding. So you make your own. So, of course, the more events, the more exciting cafes, shops, etc lures to the public who might spend and therefore contribute to your income, the better. But of course, the public want stuff, and they want toilets. So I've got, let me tell you, this is <laughs> a, a, case, <clears throat> a case of a new and an adapted old building doing the loo and doing the shop and doing it quite well. Tim would remember this with regret, but um, bats have been a big issue in at least Sydney and, Botani and Melbourne Botanic Gardens, perhaps others. And bats, you can't blame the poor creatures. We've cut down most of the habitat, so they go where the food is. Uh, but that means killing a lot of even rarer, even more endangered trees. So this sort of thing, we, we've lost some of the best collection of cowries, Pacific cowrie trees in the country. We've planted more thanks to bats, but um, planting more elsewhere and, and spreading that habitat load is a bit of an issue. Uh, there's also, you know, they're an attraction. People love bats. I mean, I remember when the Olympic Games was on, uh, Americans and other tourists saying, this is wonderful to see a wild creature near a city, you know, 10 minute walk from a, st a shopping street and here I am with a wild creature, followed by somebody who's terrified about Lissa virus straight after. Fashion and makeovers and television and half-hour segments where your life is solved and whiz-bang designers are both a positive and a negative for botanic gardens and any public garden. 
you know, that can be a wonderful thing, that can attract people, that can certainly focus attention. Oh, have you seen the volcano in Melbourne? This is Jamie Dury trying to sex up the, the succulent garden in Sydney. You could debate whether he succeeded. And here's Andrew Laidlaw, you know, recreating or reinterpreting William Guilfoyle's volcano, which was a dressed up reservoir, a tank of water at the top point of Melbourne Botanic Garden, but really interesting lava flow kind of red gardens. And dry gardens, again, clever messages about what might survive in a future hotter, drier Melbourne. Uh, kind of fun. Here's Adelaide, re rebuilding a Victorian glass house for five minutes in the 19th century. We were all nuts on giant water lilies and standing your little child on the lily pad and, you know. I've got one, oh, mine's flowering, you've only got one, I've got two, uh, all this sort of nonsense. But anyway, here's a brand new glass house with that water lily doing, you know, doing that sort of stuff in Adelaide. This was the latest thing delivered to Sydney, the banana and the pyramid in the 1970s, or was it 80s, courtesy of the um, government architect, demolished to do the calyx. And, you know, this is the life of award-winning buildings, seems to be 30 years. So. It wasn't, you know, because it was designed by an architect, it's a very good question is, do you garden? Like, do you have any idea what plants need? So you can just imagine trees inside a nice shape. Did it work? And perhaps it didn't work. But I'm not convinced that, you know, an empty shell with half a flower arrangement in the middle of a pool of water is any uh, gain for the world of plants. Uh, and perhaps that's being unkind because it's, in one sense, a success, the calyx. This is a new exhibition space. They kept the banana. That you can just make out the banana behind, and we've got a new donut in front. And it's, it's full of excitement. There was an exhibition on chocolate, and there was a ripping good exhibition on chocolate, and then there was a rip exhibition on carnivorous plants, which is what you can see there. Maybe it works. I'm not sure. But I guess it it's, tells you what's going on. This was a demonstration plot of grasses in Sydney, which has been reimagined and put into, I think, better use uh, for ground covers in general, not just grasses, but all sorts, and not just rectangles, but different shapes. And that's quite exciting if you've got a small area and don't want to mow grass and want to see what looks good and what looks good in Sydney. Um, so a clever adaptation. We're doing a lot of new botanic gardens ourselves. There's a whole crop since the 70s and another crop in the 90s. And here's Mount Annan, which was farming land, and telling the story of evolution in Australia. And Gondwana, we heard yesterday about Gondwana land and Zealandia. Fantastic. You can see the most primitive plants on Earth and then follow the trail as they get more complicated going down the path and downhill. The Spanish are doing this too. And here we are in Valencia, an 1810 botanic garden, talking to you with a brand new rock garden, but talking to you about endangered species or imported succulents. And you might recall that Spain was running half of the New World at one stage. And, uh, you know, the Americas, like California, good Spanish name, or Mexi Mexico, Venezuela, a couple of good Spanish names. So where succulents come from, that part of the world. Succulents might be our future. Here's Adelaide quite sensibly displaying them, and not the most exciting photo, Stuart, but a water-saving garden paid for by a bank that tells you a little bit about modern economics. But Adelaide's not known for high rainfall, so that's actually a, a very smart move. And because it, it's well designed and well planted, it's actually really attractive. And heaven forbid there's a shop where you can buy stuff from the Diggers Club to take home. So very smart. Do they do public education? That's probably one distinction between a botanic garden and a park. Are there labels? What is that tree? You know, what's that gorgeous ground cover with the yellow bits? You know, so here's a label in Spanish, but actually it's in Latin, so that's helpful, uh, with an origin, with a family, and with a, a common name. And not all labels do that. Here's a tr tree trunk that's actually a Canary Island pine with some Canary Island pines at the end of it, and a display about forestry and, you know, the timber on the Canary Islands. And here's a laboratory and a visitor centre. So do they do education is, is a good question, and what sort? Is it just about flora? Is it also about cultivated flora? And here, the Spanish are very inclusive. I thought that was interesting. Here's a collection of old grapes, 300 old grapes, with labels, with regions. Here's a collection of citrus, you know, very important plants to that country, not native, but absolutely fundamental to the economy, to the diet, and to the sort of, you know, you think about Seville and you think about oranges. The oranges don't come from Spain. There's a collection of 
Fantastic. This is Madrid Botanic Garden. Here's Sydney, uh, dishing it up to the herb lovers of the world and pitching at the culinary, persons of culinary interest in plants. A smart move in the 80s. Uh, in the 90s, thanks to Carrick Chambers, and uh, with the little pavilion added more recently. We're very interested in food, and herbs are a no-brainer. No you don't have to live with 50 acres to grow a herb. You can have a balcony. Uh, you might just like cooking. So who are these audiences? Here's another bank, Hong Kong Shanghai Bank, uh, funding uh, a tis-up of an oriental garden based around some old trees and plants that aren't were there already but a young planting, and Melbourne's done the same with a South Chinese collection, um, in a way appealing to that part of Australia's audience. You heard from James yesterday about racism and the Chinese. Uh, long uh, and very in, um, industrious involvement with horticulture. And most of our favourite plants, funny that, like the camellia, like the magnolia, come from guess where? Singapore are quite shameless about this and quite uh, frankly commercial, and you'll find the Kiwis are a bit this way too. And, th and that's quite smart, you know, if, if some pop star pops in for five days to do a concert, they'll launch an orchid and they'll name it after them and they'll be all over the papers. So Singapore Botanic Gardens, you could say how crass, how vulgar, you know, or they have a big shop or five shops, you know, where you can just buy orchid tea or, you know, gorgeous sort of weird things to do with plants. Quite clever, because, like, who is my audience? What would they be interested in? How can I cater to that? Here's Jeff Duggan, the guy grinning and sort of crouching, doing a dry stone wall um, building course in the Grevillea Garden in Mount Annan. These people are not necessarily gardeners, but they're very much happy to be there. They're very much learning from our master dry stone waller, uh, and they're leaving a legacy for the garden. How fantastic is that? It also costs the government nothing unless somebody dies. Uh, <laughs> it's not all white. I'm pleased to say other colours are creeping into botanic gardens. And here's a black moment, uh, or as my Aboriginal colleague Pamela would say, a shame job ab about, <laughs> about occupation and invasion of Sydney. And it's beautifully done. You could say it's a bit blunt, but um, the first farm, you'd have all heard of the first farm and Farm Cove, right, just above it. This is where the, the most gridded early beds of Sydney, the heart of Sydney Botanic Garden was, and the first farm was. But it was an Aboriginal place before that, of course. So this is all about Aboriginal people, their connection to nature, their use of that bay or that area, and their love of plants or need for plants. Uh, and also the sort of unsuccessful efforts at first European cultivation of stuff. It didn't really work. Now, who is my audience? I rather enjoyed this. This is a moment with uh, Queen Victoria and Lady Gaga. What a combination. In a fern house in Sydney. But it's quite clever signage because Lady Gaga, like, who cares? But actually, you know, if you're under a certain age, people care immensely about her. I barely know who she is, but there, you know, there she is. She's probably never seen a fern in her life. But it's clever. It's very clever. So think about signage and think about making it fun. And who am I talking to? You know, not just I'd like to tell you X, Y, Z about ferns, but who is you is a good question with signage. Sometimes buildings uh, get repurposed, as architects like to say. Here's a repurposed palm house with no palms in it. But it has art exhibitions, and I have to say some very good. And again, that's an audience, and botanical art doesn't have to be of plants. You know, another reason people will come, another attraction for your garden, you know, maybe it didn't work as a palm house, maybe it's better off that way. Dodgy photograph, but art creeps into botanic gardens, and that can be a wonderful thing. This is um, uh, sandwiches of glass with eucalypt seeds down the middle as the filling, translucent filling, with poetry by Australian writers about eucalypts and Australian trees and forests. Wonderful. And if you have ever got a spare half hour in Sydney, go for a walk down the Yurong Peninsula, which is Mrs Macquarie's chair, like ignore the tour buses, and go for a stroll and read about trees. Clever piece of sculpture. Here's another clever piece of sculpture. Mrs Macquarie was the governor's wife, but a Scot and homesick, and she used to gaze at the heads, Sydney Harbour heads, perhaps a new boat, perhaps a letter from home. So this is a, a, a she might have sat here at a moment, reinterpreted, but it's cunning. It's by an artist with a very black sense of humour. 
So those roof trusses are aracaria fronds, actually. There's barbed wire and axes in the walls. It looks rather pretty until you get close, and then you start to ask questions. Art can be very good. I was very skeptical about Peter Booth. You've seen his sculptures here, perhaps, but this, this stone thing, you'll see a few of these in New Zealand. It's river stones threaded onto a shape, uh, and then this lumpy bit of sandstone. It's supposed to be about um, micro bat habitat, the stone thing, and it's supposed to be about an evocation of a Sydney sandstone landscape. It was a piece, a large donation of money from a rich person who thought, you know, he liked the Botanic Gardens and liked art, so could we just put that in there, please? Not a bad thing, but how do you do it? Uh, I was changing my mind when I saw this, that they love it. And if that's the only thing those kids enjoy in the Botanic Garden, they'll be back. Can we go and climb that thing again? So children, you know, who is my audience and what do they want? I think they've been banished now and it's, it's, it's full of plants again. So watch that space. But um, it might be better just as a piece of play equipment, perhaps interactive art. And it is sandstone, so it's hardly going to break. They might break. Here we are in Soyer on a clearer uh, hour of the day, looking at canary pines, looking at euphorbias, looking at um, the local flora, and also looking at the local limestone, those paths, those retaining walls, those beds are all local. So it's partly about traditional construction techniques, traditional irrigation, really interesting. And it's also partly about conservation and propagating a native orchid, putting it back into the wild, propagating a peony that's got three plants left on one island and putting it back into the wild. Gardens can be very active conservation spaces. Here's a giant dandelion. Don't do this at home, about a metre across. The Canary Islands has the most wonderful flora and hardly any, any of it left. But here's artichokes down the bottom. You know, again, cultivated vegetable diversity that perhaps is out of fashion or too prickly or you know, too big. Here's this construction technique stuff and some of this irrigation stuff. There are other messages a, a, a garden or a repurposed garden can put across, not just plants. Not the most exciting photographs, but here's Sydney's attempt to do the same thing, to talk about endangered species. Interestingly, there's a lot of thefts of plants from this part of the garden, which tells you about some people valuing endangered species. Um, but again, education. Christchurch Botanic Gardens um, is going a little bit native. It's, not, it's got a lovely New Zealand native section in the garden, but here we are on the banks of the Avon. Not, you know, pandered uh, turf to the edge, but some shaggy looking carracks, some shaggy looking uh, strappy things like flax and cabbage tree. And, you know, it's not the Avon in England, because the Avon in England would not look like that, but it, it puts you in Christchurch. And that perhaps those, you know, dazed tourists having a Romeo and Juliet moment on the boat might gaze over and might learn something. Singapore has really good um, glimpses of science available to the casual stroller. You know, here we are doing tissue culture of orchids in bottles and in laboratories under lights. And you can peer in through a window and see that. Or here we have a really good library, part of which is open to the public every day. Fantastic come and check out you know, the latest magazine or whatever. We think we're clever, but we're still discovering nature. We're still discovering plants. You know, we've been in Australia how long? And you know, here's a living dinosaur that was supposed to be a fossil, you know, 10 or 15 miles from Sydney. And here's the plant you know, in the middle of your garden. Pretty good. Here's that one the secret scientific activity happening in Singapore on your left. Here's a supermodel. She looks like she's died, but it's actually a fashion shoot. That was the only people using the Evolution Garden the day I was there in Singapore. But, you know, I guess you'll be all over Vogue Singapore tomorrow, so is that a bad thing? No. Does that maybe get people into the garden? Yes. You know, so make them pay for it. That's my suggestion. Here we are doing a bit of, you know, crass commercialism too. But on the right, um, the Green Gallery is Singapore's greenest building, paid for by, I forget, but a big company. And it had an exhibition on medicinal plants and ethnobotany to Malay people, all in Malay language. Fantastic. So perhaps a whole new audience rocks in because it's all about them. Delicious. And then that exhibition, of course, will move on. So change could be a good thing. It's just really, is it managed, I suppose? And do they contribute to the people next door and to daily life? 
You know, is it a pleasant place to walk the children? Is it a pleasant place to walk the dog if you're allowed? Um, up the top, you know, pretty ordinary suburbia around um, Valencia's Botanic Garden. Oh, and down the bottom, it's not a botanic garden, it's a park, but it's a totally faked up park, which is all about Valencia's water system, all about rice, and you might have enjoyed paella, paella, that comes from that part of rice growing Spain. So it's all about water and moisture and cultivation. Clever. I mentioned kids, um, universities and researchers. You know, here's the Singapore Botanic Gardens management team pretending to be kids on a swing bridge in Botanic Gardens. Fantastic. And here's the butterfly house where it's all about butterflies. Here's some Singapore kids just doing what kids want to do in a fantastic kids garden. And notice the signage can't be read by you, but that's good because it can probably be read by someone else. So how many languages are your signs in is a good question for any botanic garden purporting to be pandering to a community or to tourists. Here's a school group doing secret school business in a shrubbery in the Canary Islands. And here's a lovely outdoor pavilion because it gets pretty warm, so shade more than cover uh, walls where you can do stuff, have a talk, build a fire, learn something. One of my favourite words is digitise, and that's the best thing that Botanic Gardens can do, really, to open up to the world and unzip those white scientific coats a bit, is get their stuff online, or some of their stuff. So here's Singapore doing it, and notice the veil. Uh, here's Sydney doing it, care of a Dutch company, right now, and that massive warehouse down the bottom, I think, is... Uh, Picture, that company's digitization project in Europe. It's quite a serious, some of these herbariums are enormous, as Tim's mentioned, so big job. But get on with it, even if just your most rare and endangered stuff. Here's Singapore opening three, not one, but three new metro stations to make it more accessible to grandparents, to kids, to prams, to family groups. And you walk into any gate, and there's a greeter on that gate in your language. Saying, saying welcome, and what would you like to see? Smart ideas, are they not? Here's a uh, philanthropy I should mention, and people who like gardens or can be persuaded to chip a spare 10 grand, or perhaps it's 100, perhaps it's a million, uh, have built things like this, the fernery, thanks to the Fairfax family, James in particular, in the 90s. Lovely, just a sort of a retreat place. Here we are talking of retreats, just pushing the kids on a swing, just going for a jog, or just having a moment away from downtown hustle. They're, they're little green spaces. Sometimes they're very designed, but I thought this was interesting. That I'd never seen mobile phones on park signs until I went to Barcelona, but here we are doing Facebook and Twitter in 2005 in Catalonia, you know, in a very hard-edged designed botanic garden number two, this is the new one, and herbarium, that funky thing up the hill, is all science. Quite interesting, but who gets to interact and how do you interact is a good question. Who runs this place? Just experts? Can I have a say? Well, maybe you should. I'm probably banging on about commerce a bit much, but um, here's some of the shops with some of the tat in Singapore, there's quite a bit of it. I have to be fair, some of it was quite good too. Just, to, you know, I'm a, I'm a very hard audience to please, but who is the audience? You know, what kind of stuff do we have in the shop? How much of that kind of thing, you know? Not everyone wants to buy serious scientific papers or the latest ecology journal. Sometimes, and Sydney's particularly good at this, uh, money grubbing and making your own income is really all it's all about anymore. So can we have a party? We'd like to have our group, our company, have the best spot under the bridge for the fireworks for New Year's Eve. And oh, I'm sorry, madam, that, that spot is booked. And we'd like a picnic. Well, you have to book a spot for a picnic. Uh, income and events are really all uh, a government wishes to hear about in New South Wales at the moment, and perhaps in other places. And that's good and bad, but you know, activating redundant assets and what's that done for the public lately? You know, and it might be parties, it might be opera on the bay, very nice, did you go, wasn't it wonderful? They may never otherwise go to the Botanic Garden, so is that a bad thing? Maybe not. You know, how many operas, are, how many a year is probably the more, more the question. Or how do people get in and get out without trashing the garden? You know, the, the shortest route to the car park afterwards is like a war zone. It, it, 
there are impacts, there are positives and negatives from this, but it's happening. Here we are doing it on Sydney Harbour. Can you make out a plant in that photograph? But here we are doing it on Singapore Day, on National Day, which is quite a big thing, and with a Beethoven moment in Singapore down the bottom. So it's not just Sydney. Uh, this is a common problem around the world. Q, uh, you know, you would think Q was safe from budget cuts, not safe. So, you know, that was a big fight just in a, the most recent years. Um, yeah, that's about all I had to say, but I hope there might be a question or two. Hi, Stuart. Um, as you know, I love botanic gardens too, so I really enjoyed your talk. Um, a few years ago, you mentioned that you were worried that the cruisers <laughs> were going to take over the botanic gardens, and you mentioned also, you know, matter of management and who gets to have a say. Um, do you, in for the botanic gardens in Sydney, does, are there any public representatives on the board? Is there? Yeah, right. I, I, not sure, but I think yes. Short answer is probably yes. And there's more than one board, so there's more than one way. Like the Friends, often the Friends group have a lot more power than they think. And, you know, the art gallery next door is a good example. And actually, in Sydney, those two groups, not the Friends, but you know, those two organisations are actively at war. Like, to double my gallery space, I'd just snatch a bit of your land, the mainland, to stick my extension on, because it's just land, you know? And it's got a harbour view, so... But that's not necessarily supported by the community or the people on the board. So, to be fair, I think probably the answer is yes, and there's probably lively debates behind closed doors we're scarcely aware of. <laughs> and there should be. And to that, have, do you feel as if the crews side of the business has got, got a bit too much control over the botanic gardens or, you know, how, how the public is managed. Yes, I do, which is why I'm giving this talk, really. I, th I think we're all um, customers, we're all engaged and we're all a bit too blasé about this and a bit too disengaged. My, my father used to say, citizen, if you thought about it, citizen is the most powerful concept in the world, that we've all got to vote and we all put up with this, so whatever this is. So if you don't like something, don't grumble to your friend over a cup of tea. Do something constructive. Get on the board, you know. Withdraw your funding. Make a request at the shop, you know. Hassle your MP, whatever it is. Put your gorgeous grandchild in front of a bulldozer and get them photographed. For the <laughs> We've all got grandchildren. What have they done for the world lately? <laughs> Rat baggery. Like, don't get mad, get even. Um, hi, I'm, I'm a guide at the Royal Botanic Gardens in Hobart. Good for you. And we just did tours on endangered species. And as I was taking a tour towards an endangered plant, a cryptandra, there were two teenage girls down on the footpath picking it. And, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, yes. maybe the signage is a problem. Maybe we're, you know, bringing people in, they're becoming interested and so yes. on. And they're destroying what... What's there? Look, absolutely. You're talking to the guy who got reprimanded twice on an International Dendrology Society tour of Cranbourne last week for A, stepping on beds, and B, picking the odd thing for educational purposes, I might add. <laughs> so perhaps I'm not the person to answer that question, but my, my slight and pathetic defence was there was no signage, and why are we 20 minutes into a walk when you mentioned that not stepping on the beds is an issue? Like, why isn't that... Oh, there was, a, there was one sign, which if you were chatting... <laughs> there's, a better per, there's a better person to answer this. <laughs> I, I, don't, I, I was wondering whether to <laughs> interject or not. There's, there's so many things. I think, I think the talk is fantastic. I think you, and you're quite carefully showing there are two sides to all this. 
And some of the things like signage are fascinating because we, we debate that a lot in the gardens and you could fill the place with signs, don't pick the flowers, don't walk on the garden beds. And um, the them. best way is to put prickly plants at the edge to... <laughs> But, but also, also yeah. accept that, well, people like Stuart, but accept that uh, people will walk onto the garden beds and, and you just, you have to create little spots where they're going to do it. If, if you create a, there's a lovely tree there and people are going to hug it, yep. you've got to accept they're going to step out onto the garden yes. bed. I think we've got to be much more tolerant of that. So I think that's really important, Stuart. Absolutely. And maybe it's a sacrificial part. You know, you do that one part, but a more valuable, you just be a bit strategic. It's also an education opportunity. Look, turned around, rather than getting angry and going, at that person. It's like, I was reading about George Fuller, this wonderful man who used to run Pukekura Park in New, New Plymouth, which should be called a botanic garden, and isn't. You know, and he would get skinny dippers in the lake at night and people throwing supermarket trolleys just for a joy lark, or people cycling through Pukekura Park. He would jam a, a rake handle through the, through the things. He would move the clothes of the skinny dippers at night, so when they... <laughs> Don't get mad. Don't get mad. Get even. <laughs> Seeing as I've got, can I add one one other quick thing? Just <laughs> while I have this, the I gave a talk at the Begans conference just a couple of days ago called uh, Nature, Culture, and Science, and I was taking a, a sort of different tack on the same topic, but I was trying to explain the botanic gardens to a whole range of things, from you know conservation science to recreation to people just enjoying themselves, hanging out, and when we do visitor surveys and we break down the groups of people, there's about 16% who come in who love plants, the plant lovers. There's a, a curious group, another sort of 13%. The rest are there to meet people, to enjoy the, the landscape. And we have in our charters and acts usually a recreation and a, a sort of a, you know, a, a, a part of our act that says, do things so that people will be happy. And if you go back to Mueller and Guilfoyle and my garden, they had military bands, they had concerts under the uh, pavi under the little um, sort of pavilion. So it's a, it's a real mixed bag and a complicated place to run. So yeah, I, I think it's it's great to, to talk about it. And I would suggest you do give feedback because it is the community through boards and friends that change. But just be aware that sometimes we're not the the biggest audience to botanic gardens. Absolutely, yeah. W when the Olympic Games was on, I can't stand sports, so I volunteered to be on the gates of the botanic gardens in Sydney for three weeks. And you get the best questions, you know. Crass American, oh God, the real estate on the park's so cheap here, you know. How much is an apartment? You know. <laughs> oh my God, followed, followed by some guy full of tattoos and t face piercing saying, I've got 15 minutes, where's your African conifers? You know, best, best, <laughs> best question in three weeks. Uh, the vexed question of whether entry should be by payment of a fee. Um, I'm constantly amazed and delighted being stopped in the Melbourne Gardens by visitors from overseas who cannot believe that we don't charge for them to enter. Um, of the gardens that you've spoken about, are they fee paying or open to the world? Okay. Um Half and half, I'd have to say, Ian. For example, Singapore, the first time I went to that botanic gardens, I skipped the orchid garden because you had to pay to go in. How stupid, like, you know, one of the best in the world. But it's worth it, and it's fenced, and people steal orchids. Um, mostly not paying. And an interesting observation on this, again, I've, I've slagged the art gallery in Sydney. Edmund Capon, who ran that and put it on the map, really, in the 70s, said, we're not going to charge for this, but we'll get them in the shop and in the cafe. And he's right, they, people will come, they're comfortable to come, and then you know you, you get your income another way. Uh, generally, no, I think, and perhaps that's why we want people to come, or even to know and to advocate. That's, that's clever. All right, 45 seconds, go. I think, Stuart, just as a point of information, your idea of uh, suggestions about collaboration, uh, there's a fantastic new project starting this year oh, and rolling out next year that'll run over the next five years, a collaboration between Royal Botanic Gardens Sydney, the Australian National Botanic Gardens Canberra, um, a part of your department that you don't work in, um, uh, um, and several other agencies along with Macquarie University, funded in part by the friends of the Australian National Botanic Gardens, he says to get a plug-in, um, 
on genetic plasticity, on, on looking at the way in which alpine through to, to uh, arid zone plants will respond to uh, environment, uh, uh, climate change, which will be a really important way of working out selection for both domestic and public plantings of plant, plants. So there, there, is, there are things like that actually developing. Fantastic. Thanks. And a reminder, Stuart will be here for the rest of the week, so <laughs> any more burning questions can be directed to him during the course of the rest of the conference. So I will just have a small gift to give to both John and Stuart, um, and if everyone can please join me in thanking them for their time today. <laughs> <laughs>